Hi there, and welcome to another quick primer on the essential ideas behind behavioural economics. As Ha Jung Chang reminds us in his uh, recent book about economics, there are many alternative schools of thought uh, to the ones that necessarily dominate teaching in schools and colleges and universities. Ha Jung argues there's at least nine major schools of economics, ranging from classical and neoclassical through to Keynesian, Austrian and behavioralist economics. And it's this primer that looks at the rise of behavioral economics, and in particular, the extent to which the null model of agent behavior was challenged uh, in recent times. The null model of agent behavior, agent behavior has dominated orthodox economics for decades. The, the core assumption of rationality dominated, pervaded standard economic thinking and economic theory for decades. The null model assumed that agents choose independently, uh, and also that an agent, for example a consumer, has fairly fixed and consistent tastes and preferences. They are assumed to gather full, complete information on all the alternatives. And uh, they always make an optimal, maximising choice, given his or her preferences. Now this assumption of rationality and complete information dominated not just microeconomic thinking, but also the foundations of macroeconomics. For example, rational expectations. But... As many economists have pointed out, economic theories usually are only as good as their assumptions. Yes, if we live in a world of full, complete information, then fine, this, this theory of rational behaviour, optimising decision-making, is a powerful idea, probably fine. But of course, we don't. A lot of uh, behavioural economics flows from some of the challenges that came to economics in the 1970s and 1980s. George Akerlof and Joseph Stiglitz won the 2001 Nobel Prize in Economics for their essential work on information economics, which challenged the idea that people and businesses, any agent, had complete information. Indeed, one of their insights was that different agents may have varying amounts of information. We talk about asymmetric information in, for example, the market for cars, the used cars, the labour market when you're hiring and firing staff, and lots of other uh, markets and economics. But, crucially, this work on information failure still made the working assumption that people make the best choice they can given the information they have. Nonetheless, the work of Joseph Stiglitz and George Akerlof did extend the, the ap applicability, the realism of conventional theory and has been widely absorbed into mainstream e economics, not least government intervention in markets on grounds of information failure um, and the regulation of businesses, for example. So information economics challenged the idea of complete information, but it was the work of psychologists, notably Daniel Kahneman and the late Amos Tversky, they got the Nobel Prize for Economics a year later, that really changed the rules of the game it was a groundbreaking change in economics. This is a brilliant quote from Danny Kahneman. Agents reason poorly and act intuitively. What Kahneman and Tversky did, and this is um, explained beautifully in a, in a terrific read by Michael Lewis, the author of The Big Short and other books of Moneyball. His new book is called The Undoing Project. What Kahneman and Tversky did is they set up numerous often quite re revealing experiments in which there was a rational answer, but people frequently didn't choose it. And it wasn't just, you know, drunken students that didn't choose it. We're talking about high-profile academic professors who weren't choosing the rational answer to a particular problem posed. Michael Lewis's book is, is superb at explaining some of those quirky examples. What Kahneman and Tversky did was they observed systematic deviations from rationality. This was essentially the genesis of, of behavioural economics. And indeed, lots of behavioural economics since has, has looked at how rational firms can take commercial advantage of consumers acting irrationally. Uh, for example, scarcity bias uh, used by businesses such as EasyJet and Booking.com to encourage people to, to book early uh, a seat or a hotel room. So Kahneman and Tversky really were groundbreaking in their analysis that challenged the fundamental assumption, the null model of rational behaviour. 
Kahneman and Tversky's work uh, developed. Uh, Tversky died in 1996. Kahneman's work has developed in terms of dual system theory. So we think about the brain as having a system one thinking and system two. System one is fast, intuitive, immediate, often subconscious, almost if you like automatic thinking. You go into the supermarket, a lot of your behavior is system one thinking. You pick up the same items you've done before without thinking. You drive to work, oftentimes uh, you might drive 20 minutes to work and you don't remember the journey. It's so automatic, it's so, it's so intuitive. System two thinking is a much slower, deliberative, contemplative system of thinking. Uh, it's controlled, it's calculating, uh, but it uses, up, it uses up the brain's, brain's batteries pretty quickly. Now we tend to use system two when a decision is particularly important for example, a pension decision or when to retire, highly personal to us. And when our decision may have a, an impact on, a, on other people and if we're reminded that the decision has a social, social impact. System two often kicks in when we're faced with particularly complex decisions that involve lots of looking at data and, and, and thinking about different alternatives. But in that situation, Carlo and Tversky's work suggests that people allow their system one to take over and they can make an intuitive, immediate decision without necessarily thinking through the implications, particularly a short-term decision which has long-term effects. Kahneman and Tversky and others in the field have discovered and built and researched numerous so-called cognitive biases. These are biases in behaviour. If you go to Wikipedia, there's well over 150 listed. Uh, we'll have a separate YouTube video on many of these. For example, we have a video on anchoring. Anchoring is when people rely heavily on what is actually essentially an irrelevant piece of information, but they use it to make a decision. The, avail the availability heuristic is when you overestimate the chance of something happening because something similar has happened recently. Uh, so, for example, you, you, you read in the paper about a shark attack and you overestimate the risk that you'll be involved in a shark attack or a lift accident or a plane crash or what have you. But there are lots of biases. Hindsight bias, the tendency to see events in the past as having been predictable. I quite like the IKEA effect, where people overvalue or increase their value on something where they've had an input, self-assembly furniture. Companies using the scarcity bias, we value something more if it's thought of as rare. So you know, uh, the last cheap airline seat is something we have, we have to have. And sunk cost bias, we continue to do stuff. Our behaviour, we kind of continue because we've invested time, money, energy and effort into something, even though we perhaps should bail out and uh, move on to another choice. Now, you've ordered a large Domino's pizza and you may continue to eat it. You, you, the thought of leaving half the pizza in the box, even if for tomorrow, is, is too much uh, because you've invested £16.99 in the Domino's pizza. So what we find happening, and this is where the really interesting economics, I think, is, is developing at the moment, is a new, a different model uh, of behaviour, of choice, decision making. So we go back to the null model and we start to question and challenge it. Economic agents have limited computational capacity. Their brain processing power is limited, or mine is. Our agents are influenced strongly often by the social context of decisions. They're influenced by their social networks, the people they live with, the people they associate with. And they're also influenced by the impact of their actions on, other, on others. People often act reciprocally. In other words, you know, they, they help each other. Uh, they don't necessarily act purely in a self-interested vein. People often lack self-control, particularly if they don't consider the long-term effects on things. They make different choices when they're cold compared to when they're hot and emotional. People, instead of doing hugely complex calculations, oftentimes fall back on simple rules of thumb. We call them heuristics. And they can work well for people most of the time. They tend to satisfy, they do okay, rather than maximise their utility. And as we've said before, they're influenced by lots of cognitive biases. Not to, all, not to the same extent, but these are biases which people find often very hard to overcome. So this is a new model of behaviour that starts to emerge. I love this quote from Rory Sutherland from Ogilvy. In the economist's mind, People are assumed to be calculating rationalists. They merely seek to maximise their own utility 
in a world of perfect information. But we know that the human is far less a rational calculating machine than an anxious, moralizing, herd like, reciprocating, image conscious storytelling game theorist. That's the reality of the world in which we live. Now, there's lots of books on behavioral economics. My advice is probably to avoid the behavioral economics that you can find in an airport bookstall. Risk Savvy is superb on heuristics. Positive Linking by Paul Ormod is excellent on network economics. Paul, Paul Economics by Banerjee and Esther DeFlo is very good on behavioral aspects of development policy. David Halpern's new book, Inside the Nudge Unit, is terrific on policy applications of nudges, behavioral nudges, in the context of the UK and the Behavioural Insights team. Thaler's Misbehaving is essentially an autobiography of his work in behavioural economics. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow is the classic text on psychology by Danny Kahneman. And a new book for, for January 2017, which I think could be a terrific one for students to have and to use if you're, if you're part of your course, is the new Oxford Very Short Introduction to Behavioural Economics by the excellent economist Michelle Badley, latterly of Cambridge University. That is a book that I will personally have on my, on my desk when I'm teaching behavioural economics this term. Well, I hope you found this quick primer on behavioural economics useful. Uh, check out a range of shorter videos on YouTube for other aspects of behavioural economics. Okay, thank you.